Oh, okay. So probably we won't bother with our round table. Either. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, ah, right. Oh, yeah. Hi, folks. If you're online, we're going to get going here in a couple of minutes. Be people settling away in the room here with us. It's like old times. We're in what used to be called the, the common room. What's it called now? Oh, I thought it had a new name. Ah, okay, but the room is still the same. We used to have the Harris Center Christmas party here when you were allowed, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And Dr. Leslie Harris could be here with us. No? Is it called baffling? They might be baffles. It'd be appropriate with me presenting. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No, I have to be very selective on my restaurants if I want to have a conversation. My voice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. But we will, during the meeting, potentially ask, I may ask some of you to say something. So maybe. Oh, shoot. Okay, sorry. You are way ahead of me. Another couple of minutes. So I think we will do a quick round table in the room. Josh, why don't you lead off? Thanks for coming. to have you here. For anybody online, if you can hear me, during the session, if people speak in the room, we will give them a mic from here on in. Andy will give you the heads up when we're live. Dr. Vardy, good day, sir. I just asked my secretary to tell someone the front steps are treacherous out there. So maybe they'll be better when we go out before they're totally buried in snow. Yeah, exactly. There's a bunch of people online will start up in a couple of minutes, Dave. We have coffee and goodies over there if you're so inclined. in person with human beings. Oh, that's great. Okay. Well, we're uh, going to get going here, folks. I may sit. We'll decide how it goes. Now, Boyan says I need to look that way, but the slides are this way. So I'm going to go back and forth. Uh, and maybe I will stand, actually. I always feel more comfortable in motion when I'm presenting. And uh, we'll have some slides to walk through an update on what the Harris Center has been up to lately and our current plans. But uh, 
as always, we're open to anyone jumping in anytime to ask a question or make comment. And then we have lots of time at the end for, for discussion and debate. There's a bunch of Harris Center people here and associates and advisory board members. And uh, we have a, a bunch of people online as well as in the room. So we've done a lot of hybrid in recent years. So hopefully this will all work well. And uh, welcome wherever you are online. So we'll go to the, the first slide, Mandy. So the Harris Center, I think this is our third five-year plan that we're into, and we do an annual strategic action plan. And with someone like Josh in the room, I'll make my usual brag, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're the only organization in the province that has a public consultation annually on our strategic plan. Yep, that's probably fair. Yep. And so uh, our mission uh, from the beginning, and Dr. Evan Simpson is here, who was the VP academic at Memorial, who led to the creation of the uh, what initially was CORDS, the Center of Regional Development Studies. Then we merged with the Public Policy Research Center to form the Harris Center. And our mission set out from that time, but the words have evolved a little bit. Uh, is to encourage informed public policy and regional development. So it kind of has reflected from the beginning the desire to connect on practical regional development, community development, rural development, innovation um, with faculty, staff, and students, uh, connecting to the needs of communities, organizations, business outside the university, but also public policy. That relates to regional development broadly defined. So obviously we know with the social determinants of health, the best way to be healthy is to have a job. And there's a whole bunch of other factors. Uh, but we've had endless debates, discussion over the years with the Harris Center. Our focus is regional economic development. There's lots of other organizations in the social development focus, but we know we have to have an integrated approach and it connects with environment, it connects with culture, et cetera. We are unapologetically focused on Newfoundland and Labrador, but we often partner across Atlantic Canada, across the country, around the world on initiatives that relate to uh, the needs of the province. And we have some programming, in fact, across the North these days that uh, is an innovative stretch for the Harris Center, helps Memorial, helps the province, um, and happy to debate, discuss that further as we go along. And all about supporting communication and collaboration between Memorial and the people of the province. And so our work began before the terms public engagement were all the rage over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, although, and Evan might know the origins, the mission of Memorial in this plan has included the words public engagement prior to the public engagement framework being developed for sure. So it's always been part of the uh, understanding of the role of the university. And we talk about the special obligation of the university to the needs of the province. Uh, so in any case, Harris Center, we use lots of different terms these days, the bridge, a broker, a convener, a catalyst. Uh, Dave Vardy and I, who have debated many times, Dave was the director of the Public Policy Research Center when CORDS was established. Then we agreed it made sense to merge them whether or not the Harris Center is a think tank. And we've always emphasized the university is the think tank, but we are often thought leaders in terms of identifying priorities of focus for funding or public events, et cetera. Uh, our vision uh, has been tweaked a little bit from one strategic plan to the next, but it is a vision not for the Harris Center, but for the province, as we see the role of the Harris Center, where we'd like the province to get. Harris Center's vision for Newfoundland and Labrador is of a vibrant democracy with informed citizens actively engaged in realizing a prosperous and sustainable society which values individual and collective responsibility for decision making and development true to our unique culture and identity. And so that's been tweaked a little bit over the years. But uh, when we come in, when we were in our previous building, 
We had all that painted on the wall, actually. You came in in the morning, it was there looking at you. Uh, but we keep this alive with these annual sessions and we have a monthly, uh, my staff entertain me by letting me call it a Gantt chart meeting. We don't usually use a Gantt chart, but the idea is it, it flows from our strategic plan into our regular monthly update. Uh, finally, our mandate set out in the initial documents that were approved by the Board of Regents, coordinate and facilitate Memorial University's activities relating to regional policy and development, and advise on building the university's capacity and identify priority themes and projects related to teaching, research, and these engagement would be used, but outreach still matters. There's a lot of great work done that we need to reach out on. We also though, respond to opportunities coming in and then public engagement is the stuff, the, the sweet spot in the middle where you connect together. I'll pause briefly, but anyone can jump in anytime. Mandy, are you able to chat? And if someone has a question, so feel free to use that. Mandy will let me know. Anyone in the room, any quick thoughts, comments? We'll forge ahead. We do have the mic here if anyone does want to say anything in the room. Next slide. That could be a blessing. So I can stand up here. Okay. I always go where they tell me. So, how's that? Exactly. <laughs> we may come back to that again. So, what we do, there's a whole bunch of things that have evolved over the years. And uh, bring regions and communities together is a really interesting one that at the beginning, we had the network of regional economic development boards in the province. And we did regional workshops and we would go out to them at their invitation and say, what are your priorities? How can the university teaching research service connect with your needs? And when the red bees went away, we had to revamp the way we did our work. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the Thriving Regions program. But when we showed up for several years there, Boyan in particular would be out on the front line and people would say, well, can you help us develop a strategic plan for the region? No, that's not our job. We can bring resources to the university to help with different needs you have. But that convening role was really missed in the province at the local level. And in thriving regions now, we work with a, a cross section of local organizations. It's inclusive, whoever wants to show up can show up. And, uh, but we're really missing still in this province, in some regions, in Nunatsiavut, in, uh, in the Halibu area, there are organizations that have a regional uh, perspective, but there's not many. Mobilized knowledge continues to be a key aspect of our role, and we do that through a whole bunch of online, in-person uh, events and activities. Applied research funds, right from the beginning. Uh, people have heard my story endlessly. Uh, David, some of my stories. Uh, David Freshwater has been a longtime collaborator with the Harris Center from Ontario, was based at the University of Kentucky, still is there. He was head of rural development at the OECD. Did a lot of work with our RAN lab group, Alvin Timms and Jamie Ward and, and the team. And he used to get a million dollars a year from the Tennessee Valley Authority to fund research that would help economic development in their region. And he said the best use of the money is 15,000 per project, call for proposals, one third up front, one third in the middle, one third at the end. And we did that right from the start with funding from the province and ACOA. And that model has pretty much continued throughout the years with different funding from different sources. We still, and we'll talk about the, the funds we have in place now. Dave Vardy is here. There's a group developing a fund in honor of Cabot Martin, which will be a new fund at the Harris Center, but similar type model. Uh, broker partnerships, part of Boyan's role, but all of us really, is to respond within the university and outside the university. You know someone who could connect on X. 
Uh, Yaffle was developed as a tool to help with that online. And we'll update on Yaffle. There's other universities now, several, that are piloting Yaffle, as well as more units at Memorial all the time. Analyze local data for local issues is one that really evolved coming out of the work with Alvin Sims when he was in the geography department. And uh, he continued to develop projects with the Harris Center and it evolved into what became RAN Lab, the regional analytics lab. We'll talk more about that in a little while. And so this is where Dave Vardy, I would say there are elements of the Harris Center that are morphing into think tank, not so much with our own analysts analyzing the data on public policy, and, and recommendations, but experts in data and developing the algorithms to allow modeling that then we have faculty at Memorial using RAN Lab. We have external partners feeding data in and benefiting from it. And uh, Kim Crosby is our lead, but Jamie Ward is really the, 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 the brains behind the operation, but we're actually building a team. And so uh, it's great to see that evolving. Uh, help ideas become solutions. We still are part of the innovation ecosystem at Memorial. We don't usually deal with business specific opportunities. Memorial has a great network with the MUN Center for Entrepreneurship, with Genesis. There's the Bounce Lab in partnership with Tech NL. Uh, there's the MUN Center for Social Enterprise, numerous units, engineering faculty, uh, Marine Institute, Navigate, at, uh, at Grenfell campus, but often people don't know who to turn to, so we help broker with them. And, uh, but if it's regional or sectoral or meso, not micro, that's our happy place. And often macro as well, we can connect with economists or people who deal with that. So it's, it's all lots of shades of gray. And then facilitate inform public debate. And, you know, it's the old line about the blind man and the elephant. Lots of people know the Harris Center from a particular thing we do. And when they see this presentation and what we'll finish here today, many don't know the full piece, and, but they're all tools in the toolkit. But we're also always open to adapting, innovating, and you will see we've added some stuff. But with available resources, you can't just keep adding unless you also weed. And so some things drop away. Um, pause for air there. Any quick comments on the, the broad scope of what we're up to? Following slides, we'll get into the key program areas. Okay, Manny? So I mentioned thriving regions partnership process, the early days with the regional workshop. And we had a hoot with those workshops. I mean, Boyan and Chris and the team still do. But the early workshops, we do four a year. We would have 20, 30, 40 people from month going out to a region. There was a load of planning leading up to it. And we'd identify 20 or 30 or 40 projects. Three or four or five of them would see the light of day because we didn't have any dedicated resources to them. So when the Red Bees went away, it's now a process of probably a couple of regions per year but it's a long process of a couple of years with each. And then there's a staggered different stages. And uh, we have a list of the regions where we've done the process so far. And we have exploits right in the thick of it now. And we have Terra Nova, Eastport Peninsula and surrounding area just getting going. And the energy in those sessions is amazing. Boyan, did you want to say anything about the current processes and where it's going? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we just combined the, uh, we, we basically combined aspects of applied research fund with regional workshops. And because we didn't have regional partners, the way it works is somebody has to come and ask us to do uh, the regional process in the region. Um, we asked, we say, that's great. We would love to. Um, can you put together a planning team with six other people across sectors in your region. If they can, we know that the region actually has the capacity to work together. So we meet with them and we organize the first workshop where we help them establish some priorities that then Memorial can engage on. Um, so that first workshop is really just Chris and me. We don't bring anybody um, else in, but then the other workshops are maybe a little bit more like what we used to do. Thanks, Boyan. And I think we have 
think the next slide may have some more examples of projects you saw the week. Yeah, I don't know if you want to highlight a couple of those, Boyan. Uh, maybe not any particular one, except to say that uh, for those who are researchers at Memorial, there is really no preference in terms of what departments engage. Uh, we have we have funded projects from folklore to ocean sciences center to geography, engineering. Um, so really, it's about finding a project that speaks to the region. And each project, you may have mentioned this. We have funding from ACOA and the province. Right. I think those are the sources. Yeah. At, for $15,000 per project, three projects per region. And the diversity of projects, but it's based on what the community identifies as their priority. And the university is the universe of topics. So it could be healthcare, it could be fishery, it could be you name it. And usually it's a mix. Okay, next slide. And then the applied research funding in general, thriving regions is one source where we focus those three times 15,000 for each region. But then we have other funds that go back to the early days with the COA provincial funding. For several years, we had funding from RBC Blue Water Campaign. Uh, that was $800,000 over 10 years. Um, for research on rural and remote drinking water. And that built an amazing capacity at Memorial and partnership with municipalities and communities. And that work continues with a load of faculty doing important work around the province. Now we have the West White, White Rose Employment Diversity Fund. And that is funding focused on resource sectors, not just oil and gas, but mining, agriculture, forestry, fishery, to get more diverse employment in those sectors. And we know with our demographics and our labor force challenges, we need to tap every source of employment for the good of the sectors, but of course for individuals and for their well being, getting into those sectors is key. And we've had some good projects under that fund, but not near as many as we would have thought we would have. And that was during the pandemic. And uh, there are more graduate students at Memorial as a proportion of total students. Faculty are under the gun to deliver in many, many ways. Um, and so with some of our funds, for example, the MMSB Waste Management Fund, Multi-Material Stewardship Board as a partnership with the Harris Center for over a decade that started, I think, as strictly applied research funding. But because we weren't getting, we did some real good projects for many years, we still get some. But well, then we innovated by going with a, a postdoctoral fellow and some more applied research. And we're still exploring with the MMSB new ways of doing things. So you gotta adapt as conditions change. We've been around 19 years now. And so always open to thought suggestions um, why we aren't getting the type of response we used to get. Um, Applied Research Fund is the general fund that we still maintain, but I think as the Cabot Martin Fund gets into place, we'll be able to leverage our government funding with the Cabot Martin funding to get more bang for the buck in that uh, general regional policy and development applied funding. Uh, and then Community Scholars is a new fund that the president initiated with incremental funding for the Harris Center to get more memorial faculty out in communities and postdocs for a sustained period. And uh, that's been a, a great new piece of the, the puzzle for us. And we've had uh, several different faculties, uh, faculty members and the Marine Institute tap that funding. And there's an open call on an ongoing basis. Boy, and what did I get totally wrong there? Or what would you add to? Um, actually, not bad at all. <laughs> we do have, <laughs> we do also have um, David Curran uh, undergraduate scholarship in regional development, which we uh, just closed. We have uh, so every year we uh, uh, we award one undergraduate scholarship. Any questions, comments, and all that stuff? Yep, we got the mic over here. I think. Oh, Mandy can keep going there. Sorry. 
And Mandy will keep an eye online if there's anyone who has a question or comment. Dave Hardy. Just wanted to follow up, Rob, on your comment about the, uh, the Cabot Martin Fund, because we're right in the, in the middle of that right now. And at a stage where we're trying to figure out uh, where the targeting, in terms of targeting research, where it should be, that kind of thing. And one of the things that maybe I wanted to explore, and we can put on the table the question of how do you actually select the uh, uh, successful uh, proponents, uh, the, um, the, the research, the, the principal investigators, in terms of what extent does prior, the prior work in the area count? Because I'm just curious as to the balance between people that are novitiates in the area, mm. as opposed to the people that have been you know, seasoned researchers in a particular area. And um, I suppose it would be a bit of a bias from the people uh, that, that are putting money in. They'd like to see uh, the work being done by people who've got like, some credentials behind them. And probably that would bother, would uh, sort of tend to move towards professors who've worked in uh, published research in the area. But just how, perhaps you could speak to the whole area of the balance between the young undergraduates, uh, research coming into the research budget, maybe for a, a baccalaureate thesis or whatever, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, somebody doing doctoral or postdoctoral work. And, and to what extent, the question really that I'm leading up to is how much weight do you put on uh, the amount of work that's been done in the area up to this point before they embark on the project that, for which they're applying? Thanks, Dave. Great question. I'll go to Boyan in a second. I'll, he's in the weeds in this daily, but in my broad perspective on it, one tool anyone who's ever been in a workshop with me knows is the impact first versus ease of implementation. And so you can put on a grid, how much impact would a piece of work have if it were done versus how hard would it be to implement? And, you know, there's a lot of folks, romantics who wish Newfoundland was an independent country. And you look at Iceland, and gee, isn't that amazing? We could be them. So in terms of impact, if you believe that story, it could be really high if someone did research showing how we could become an independent country. The ease of implementation is off the chart in the negative direction. It's not going to happen. So that's a, a way of thinking that if the culture we've created at the Harris Center continues, even though I'm less hands-on with some of the work, that type of thinking applies. Another element, two more things I'll say, and then Boyan can correct it all, is it's one thing to get the stars at Memorial well-established, doing work that really matters for the province, and we always want to do that. It's also important to build the next generation. And there's a lot of young faculty who are under pressure to publish and often not do publicly engaged work. Getting into tier one, peer review publications is the best way to get tenure. But there are some young faculty who are committed to making a difference early in their career. So the final point which flows from that, every fund, the committee gets together and we have faculty, staff, external folks, depending on the, the fund, and they discuss the intent of the fund, develop the criteria and apply the criteria in the call for proposals to make it clear what you're going to be judged by, and then apply it in the assessment. So, boy, any of that wrong, but what would you add to help Dave clarify? Uh, Take the mic to Dave, and then we'll get it back to you. Sorry. Sure. I would just add that it's not likely, it's not impossible, but it's not likely that an undergraduate student would win one of our applied research funds. But it is very likely that a master's student or a PhD student can write a better proposal than some of the seasoned faculty. So we have funded um, everything from master students to PhD to postdoctoral fellows to faculty. Um, but you are right, faculty would have a leg up simply because of the experience and work they have done before. And they're never starting from scratch. Um, a master's student might have to do a lot more um, literature review and a sort of a legwork before they get to the point where the, the faculty will just be starting, right? Uh, but we have seen fantastic proposals and excellent projects coming out of master's and PhD students. And I guess the final point on that is that many faculty 
apply as a PI, principal investigator, but they use graduate students in the project. Right. So you get the best of both worlds that way. They're Question is, uh, is there a weight involved? And what, but is it 10% or is it quantifiable or quantified or whatever? Uh, you know, is it material? How material is it? And the answer is yes. And in fact, we use an online tool that is used in the application process. And then it's used to enable the people on the committee to individually review each application. And they put in their scores individually, and then the tool aggregates them when the group meets. And so you have a, a kind of blind exercise that allows independence of, but then when people say, well, I judge that a seven out of 10 on this category, and I put it a four out of 10, what, what were you thinking? And those are great meetings. I miss them actually. Boy and Joe is in the middle of all of them. Um, so yeah, it's, but in the end, it's a combination of those factors and the wisdom of the committee. There is a weighting scale. So most important part of any project is um, how applicable it is to Newfoundland and Labrador. Is it addressing the real issue? And then we look at their knowledge mobilization plan. How are they going to communicate their final results and share them with those who can use them? But then there is um, um, also, I think it's 15% that we look at PI and team um, because we acknowledge that some projects are a single principal investigator can do it on their own, but sometimes they do require a team. So th there is, um, they have to submit their CV. They have to explain the strengths of the team uh, and why they are the right person to do this, right? And the community uh, makes a decision based on uh, submitted support materials. I've never been told I wasn't loud enough. That's a kind of a feels good. Okay. Ah. The little mic funny thing is on the wrong side. I don't put it upside down. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> that, that's going to be better. Sir. Yes, Fraser Pickett. Um, I guess looking at the slide itself, I'm looking at the thriving region, but then I'm also looking at a picture where you see a lot of logs, yeah. trees, one of our most natural resources, renewable, being thrown to one side. Yeah. I'm just wondering what kind of studies have been done, or are there any studies being done in relationship to the massive growth mm. of, and I don't use that word as a pun, of mass timber worldwide. It's, it's been ongoing now for the past several years. York is so far ahead of us. Uh, but I think about the most underutilized forests of uh, both the Northern Peninsula and Southern Labrador, which I know it, it had been referenced in one of the mandate letters, I think, mm -hmm. to the Minister of Forestry. Haven't heard any, but when we look at it from an opportunity, uh, the, the need for a study to say, what is this? What can we do about it? Is there an opportunity for future employment? And the fact that when the oil is gone, there are basically two renewable resources. And mass timber, I mean, that also is a net zero, mm -hmm. uh, environmental, very friendly, and I think uh, the strides made in it have been extensive. But it's something that I think uh, we as a province, or even at, from the world point of view, a study could very well need to be done to uh, give us the facts. Yeah. Um, great question. I'm going to get you to hand the mic back to Boyan. I was going to say, I hate to pick on Boyan, but actually, I love picking on Boyan. But I, I'll say, first of all, over the years, there have been studies that relate to forestry in the province. Um, the regional workshops and thriving regions have raised it. Uh, Boyne was involved in a really cool project over the last couple of years. So, when you say a bit about that. 
So short answer and then send me an email. Uh, the, so we've been, uh, during the pandemic, we've been involved with the colleagues from Grenfell Campus and Forestry Association of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, on a really interesting project exploring what is the bioeconomy potential of forestry industry. So how they can use all of their waste um, to create new innovative products or support other industries. So it was a large project. Um, because of the pandemic, we couldn't do our uh, normal workshops. So we actually produced uh, videos featuring all uh, three sawmill, lumber mills, and the corner book pulp and paper mill. And then there is another 20 minute video that's sort of what we heard report. Um, so it deals with everything from labor shortages to opportunities in creating new products from the waste. Um, such as uh, for bioenergy and a whole bunch of other things, but also possibilities to collaborate. So for example, all of the lumber mills have large kilns that right now, when the heat out of those kilns is just vented. So there is a mill in um, Bloomfield, Sexton, that now look, work, we introduced them to a potential partner and they're looking at building an experimental greenhouse that would allow them to use excess heat to heat the greenhouse. Um, Koto Siwan Mill is looking at potential um, aquaculture facility that would use um, their waste uh, for heat, uh, for heating for, as, as pellets, as well as the um, excess uh, waste from the kilns. So there's a, there's a lot of material on that, and I'm happy to send you the links to the whole thing, but it was a three-year project, so um, kind of a big, a lot of material and not enough time here to tell you all about it. So one innovative, and folks can let Mandy know if you can't hear me still, uh, hopefully better there now. Uh, Boyan did a really cool pandemic project with this on knowledge mobilization using, he's a really good photographer. And there's a film, or what do you, what would you call it? Okay, we'll call it a film. And it captures the lessons from the project, but also has people from the project involved in it. Uh, get the mic back there. I'll just finish up on the, the comment. Uh, in Ontario, there's a, and you're talking about the, all the sawmills. They've come together collectively as a co-op, joined in with a group called Element 5, which then has what's called CLT, mass producing lumber for affordable housing. Now, if you look at it from the affordable housing point of view, there's a major problem we have within, not, not only within Newfoundland, but across Canada. Therefore, the opportunity, and I know in the budget, I think there's something like $70 million over the next three years that will be put into affordable housing subsidies. So opportunity for our timber, I realize it's there today, and I realize the study may take forever mm. sometime, but the, the collective, you know, the sawmills have gotten together to feed this uh, huge plant that's there to produce what they do produce. But by having that, the supply and demand side of it is taken care of completely. And therefore the end result is a product that can be put up a building in months rather than years. So it's a, it's a fabulous thing to take away. Great. Mandy, any questions, comments online that we should deal with before we move on? Oh, we have another in the room. Uh, yeah, I'll just read out this one comment first. Uh, we have Melissa Fever online, and she says that the NLWIC also funded the research on a forest-based bioeconomy with the NLFIA. And Boyan says that's the one. Uh, and she's provided the link for everybody in case that's helpful. Fantastic. And that's the Newfoundland Labrador Workforce Innovation Center, which is based at the college in Cornerbrook. It does a lot of great labor market funded work. Right on. We have another question in the room or a comment. <laughs> yes, I'm just a uh, uh, low level student, but uh, I'm not sure whether you have uh, any funding for zero emission hmm. because uh, all of us know our Canada's uh, national target is until 2030 our carbon GHG, GHG, yep. a greenhouse 
the gas emission must be zero. And according to this, the, our GDP, the most important GDP from oil well industry. And according to this, uh, three of top five industrial GHG emitters are ammonia and zero like that. I think most important thing is we should reduce uh, what is it? greenhouse gas emission elimination. But I cannot see any funding for that. So we, uh, I'll come to in a few slides, a, a project that we've been doing on public policy over the last two years called Forecast NL, Climate, Economy, and Society in Newfoundland and Labrador. And it was really focused on precisely what you're describing, because we know with the, the climate change crisis, and when we see the extreme weather impacts very close to home in the southwest coast of Fiona, and we know globally there's many, many issues with the, the challenges we're facing. So we don't have any funding on research that relates to climate change. Our applied research fund would allow general research if anyone applied that relates to, again, our mandates, it, it would need to focus on Newfoundland and Labrador, but clearly there's lots of issues there. And I think our thriving regions process does have people, and, and maybe Boyan, did you want to speak to that? Can I get the mic? Uh, can I but maybe I'll first? give you this mic and then you can go back and forth. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Harris report issued the uh, 1990 suggested we need uh, less quota for the code. Uh, it was rejected because it's burdened to the federal government. Mm -hmm. But two years after, uh, two years in 1992, mm -hmm. uh, the federal government had to declare moratorium. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you, you may not have enough fund, I know. But you can recommend the provincial government have more funding for this uh, issue. That is the first one. And second one is uh, we export a lot of uh, gas to the world. Uh, half of our gas production is in exported. So if uh, we should keep ex uh, exported, we should uh, have more uh, elimination of greenhouse gas. I think uh, there are two levels of uh, just minority. My minority and expense is not enough, but uh, for the cap, uh, federal government, you can utilize our the sea area. Canada has uh, one of the biggest seashore, mm -hmm. which means we can utilize uh, sea instead of the land itself. Mm -hmm. I think uh, seaweed, and uh, phytoplankton emit the majority of uh, oxygen. They eliminate uh, carbon dioxide. So you can utilize it for the federal government level. It's not for provincial. But for the provincial government level, one of the most important uh, GHG emission is transportation. Mm. I know you allow some kind of uh, what is it? electric vehicle uh, subsidy. If we have enough money, that's okay. But I know, everybody knows, we have limited fund budget to utilize, uh, to re remove the uh, transportation gas emission. I think we should encourage people to use bus instead of car in in that uh, to increase it the provincial government can have some tax credit for the bus pass or they can invest more uh, economic friendly bus it's more efficient than the car subsidy so you can recommend it i know you don't have enough money mm -hmm. and time resource well, and i can address so, some of that boyan can so Maybe we should keep going, but feel okay. free to jump in again. And I know Josh is involved in a project 
and we're in the loop with a professor in political science and municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador are looking at rural transit now. And it is a challenge because of our dispersed population and massive area. Uh, but there is a real problem in rural Newfoundland, especially with an aging population. So we're looking at innovative solutions to that. Boyne, did you want to speak to a couple of the other items that were raised? Sure. There? Just um, uh, I won't speak to the GAG emission contributions because I went on that rant the other day. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, through the uh, most of our funds, including MMSB waste management fund, um, as well as through the Thriving Regions Partnership Fund, we actually do fund a fair bit of climate change related projects. They look at things like uh, how do we deal with organic waste in the province, both industrial and commercial and um, household. Uh, and we also have projects that look at things like uh, how do small municipalities and communities deal with infrastructure challenges around climate change. <coughs> so, but they can do to improve both their GAG emissions, but also also ensure that their infrastructure can withstand uh, the future weather events. And there is a, a load of work happening at Memorial on the uh, carbon and climate change impacts in the marine sector. We have a former deputy minister of fisheries and president of the Marine Institute in the room, Dave Vardy. And you mentioned the, the moratorium and we have done work related to fishery over the years. And we're working with a group right now in our convening role to hold a workshop in Gander on capelin, which plays a real fundamental piece in the food chain in the fishery and some of the issues around science around that. So there's an endless number of topics, as you know, that we could be diving into. And it's always a challenge of where you can get the funding with the right partners, with the faculty from the university. And uh, you have the mics to make a quick final comment and then we'll keep going. Okay, I just want to know where you, you mentioned the Marine Institute, yes. right? I want to know where the where today uh, uh, researching for the phytoplankton plankton or seaweed because majorly of oxygen is generated from seaweed. It's not animal. It's just uh, this plant marine plant. I want to know where they are starting because I want to start there. Right. Well, part of our role, thanks, is brokering. So I'd ask you to follow up with Boyan after. And that's exactly the kind of thing we can track down the right people and, and help you connect with them. Um, I often act like a know-it-all, but in fact, there's a lot of pieces of this university I don't know, but we'll certainly follow up. Um, okay, anything online, Mandy, or we'll go to the next slide? Okay. So you're going to go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, public policy forums. Uh, Kathy Newhook is our lead in that department. She's off sick this week, but uh, all of us uh, pitch in all the time. And of course, we all went online during the pandemic. Uh, but in fact, the Harris Center for many years prior to the pandemic had been very innovative. We had John Duff with us for years from the beginning, and he was a, not just a musician, but a computer guy and a sound guy. And when we go on the road to rural Newfoundland, we would webcast sessions long before it was fashionable to webcast sessions. And then when we moved to the Amira Innovation Exchange, which is wired to the hilt, we have the advantage of technology there. Fortunately, today they're doing the session and we weren't able to book, but it's nice to be back on the, the St. John's campus. And so we do those online sessions. They're digitally recorded. Over the last couple of years, and I'll come to it more in a minute, we focused under the broad theme of climate change. But uh, we're now also, and I'll, again, uh, at a certain point, I'll start saying, like I said earlier, but uh, we're gonna talk more about an upcoming focus on civics. So as we clue up the, uh, the Forecast NL series, and we have some regional sessions we're partnering with Econext on, that Boyan and Chris Patterson will be rolling out over the spring, summer, and fall around the island and Labrador. 
we're thinking we're, there's always ad hoc topics we cover that are important uh, in our public policy series, but we're thinking about another umbrella series around the whole issue of civics and how do citizens engage in our democracy in a time when social media is shaking everything up, traditional media is strapped for resources and is trying to deal with social media, when federal, provincial, municipal, indigenous governments are trying to adapt to all that. Uh, we have some new colleagues in political science department really interested in this stuff. And so we're quite excited. It's still very nebulous and emergent, but if people have thoughts on that, on how we can shape it or want to follow up later, uh, please do. And I think that, is there another slide on public policy, Mandy? Yeah, so the forecast NL. So maybe I'll speak to that and then I'll pause and see if folks have thoughts on any of that. So I did mention earlier and people have, uh, signs which focused on the forecast NL project this time around. The next one we work with the community foundation on and uh, every time and it will be more general drawing on the, the latest census and the, the, the uh, Rand Lab capability we have in the Harris Center. The forecast NL we decided just as the pandemic was getting going that we knew climate change was affecting every aspect of life the urgency was real, but there were so many, again, it kind of dovetails with the civics discussion. There are so many camps. There are so many single issue echo chambers with everybody vehemently agreeing with each other and hating everybody who isn't part of their group. And that isn't how a democracy can work. And so we do feel center brand of integrity and independence making a practical application to the needs of the province could really play a role in this. And so we put together a steering committee that had key experts from within the university and from outside from different perspectives. We put together a knowledge mobilization committee of all the organizations out there with a stake in this and an interest. And we put together a citizens forum, which we thought was quite innovative, which had, we chose 45 as the number of people because that was the number of people who were involved in the constituent assembly in the debate over confederation. And it was the anniversary. And we had a demographically representative cross-section by gender, by region, by education. We had all five indigenous groups represented, 45 people who committed to be engaged in all the panels throughout the couple of years or 18 months. And we would work with them then to see what issues resonated with them. And Kathy Newhook and Mandy Rousel engaged actively. We had a whole bunch of panels and sessions. I don't know, is there another slide on forecast NL? Nope, well, vital signs dug into to represent what came up of in, in forecast NL. We had great dialogue, debate, discussion, we were able to get some of the issues like the future of oil and gas, and yet the need to deal with climate change in respectful evidence-informed sessions. They're on our website, you can go back to them. There was an innovative toolkit so people could ask questions and engage after every session. And it worked. But the Citizens Forum, within three, four or five months, I would say half of the members stopped engaging and they had put up their hand to volunteer and we really tried to make it multi-channel so i think it is a we want to learn from that and as we move forward with the civics initiative uh, what can we do better and so we're, we're open to ideas so i think i'll pause for air thoughts in the room or online uh, or questions suggestions uh, Mandy, anything online before we go to the room? Okay, anybody in the room on anything what I had to say there? Yes, sir. We'll get the mic back to Fraser and Dave. Great, thanks, Josh. I, I hate to be the person saying stuff all the time. No, feel I'm free. Just doing the, the observation. 
and as a person who has been involved for a long time. Put that mic right in your mouth. Right, put the mic right up close. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, but I noticed from a point of view of citizen engagement, mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for people to really engage. I think the Harris Center is an exceptional gift that we have in our mm -hmm. province. Uh, but I'm looking at it from an engagement point of view. And tell me if I'm wrong, there are 17 people that are online right now. Mm -hmm. Now, th th that, that sort of says to me, wow, there are people opportunity to discuss some of the most critical matters in our province. And what's either we're not reaching out properly or what is the problem? Mm -hmm. Because that, that number should be in the hundreds. Yep. And that's just a, a point with uh, I just know. No, really fundamental point. And uh, a few thoughts I have, but others can join in on this. Uh, one is with the pandemic coming out of it, I think there is still a malaise. And I think we need to come up with new approaches and we're trying to find them, we're experimenting. Um, there have been times we did these sessions annually, like I brag, strategic plan consultation, when this room was full and online an equal number. Um, I don't know, I don't have an explanation. Uh, I will say we're gonna have another consultation session at our Grenfell campus in May. And so that'll be another, and I think Kim and or Kathy are gonna try to get uh, with our travel budget such as it is to our have Valley Goose Bay campus. And everything got delayed with the strike. And, but I'm knowing Josh as I do, he may have some insights on what you said and or other stuff worth hearing. And others may have thoughts on, because I, final thought, we're gonna give up the mic. I agree with you, obviously. Now, many of the sessions in Forecast NL had 200, 300, 500. So part of it is, I think, if it's a specific issue that resonates for people, those people will show up. This session is really for the policy wonks and the regional development wonks who care in general. And I wish there were more of them, but it's probably not realistic to think there would be, a, there, there used to be more showing up. And so, oh, Josh. Yeah, I, I think to that point, one of the, I'm just like looking ahead a bit too, as, as we're chatting here around, like where, where are some good centers of energy that we might tap moving forward in this? One thing, I'm feeling a lot is there is a lot of energy at that regional level happening, but it's kind of dispersed. So I'd like this has come up in other conversations I've been at with university folks recently. So there's just a lot of, there are a lot of organizations investing in regional level capacity. And one, one thing to like kind of throw a dart at the board here is to think about how we connect them better. So like there's the university doing the community hubs, there's Harris Center itself, there is like our shop, we're hiring regional staff all over the place now. The Association for New Canadians is doing the same. There's a bunch of community sector folks who are putting people on the ground with an explicit regional focus in a way that we haven't, the Community Sector Council did. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, looking forward, say 18 months, I could probably name you 30 or 40 people in the province whose job it is to do kind of regional engagement, but sometimes it's going to be a bit subject matter specific. So it's just one of the things I'm thinking of is because we get a lot of good engagement when we dial to that, like either like issue specific, but also like you're seeing lots of buy-in on those regional workshops. I think like sometimes that's the other place. And there is like, I'm just flagging, there's going to be a really good infrastructure for that that's going to want a little bit of coordinating, right? Like that's one thing to, you know, there are people right now on parallel tracks in kind of regional development within their so that's just, as we've been going through this, I think there's an interesting sort of reflection to do on how to draw that infrastructure, which is growing organically because a bunch of organizations are just like, hey, we need someone, like our regional person's job description is largely old school community development work. They're just going around getting people into rooms, figuring out what's going on, figuring out how to get the money to do their things, right? And, and lots of people are doing that kind of work right now. Uh, and it's been emerging, uh, especially because of the pandemic, kind of quietly and weirdly 
So just like it's all surfacing now and maybe a thing to flag here. Uh, I agree with you though, it is hard to bring people into these kind of strategic dialogue things sometimes. But that would just be a flag maybe that I've been thinking about as we talked about a bunch of this is that there is this community of people who maybe aren't seeing themselves yet as part of the regional development conversation, mm. but should be, right? Yep. And that's some that's a good resource to tap. That's great, Josh. Thanks. And I do think many of those sectoral focused or uh, and part of the Harris Center mandate is we don't try to be specific content experts. We tap into the university and we connect with the external partners. So uh, lots of opportunity there down the road. Other thoughts on that topic? Anything online, Mandy, that folks are asking or offering or keep going? Okay. So the next one is vital signs, which again, there are many mechanisms. So this one has massive reach and we partner with Saltwire and it's a program that came from the community foundation across Canada, there are community foundations. I think it was in Toronto where they did the first vital signs, community foundation in Toronto with the Toronto Star. And I had talked about for decades, well, not decades, but yeah, eight or nine years, the need for a state of the province report. We worked with Doug May early on in the Harris Center days, looked at various indicators, uh, reports and the genuine happiness index and so on. And when Jennifer Guy was chair of the community foundation at the time, came along and said, well, we do this vital signs thing. And it has been a fantastic partnership. The media eat it up, political parties eat it up and citizens eat it up. And a couple of years ago, we did this uh, centerfold for geeks of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador since Confederation. And I know financial analysts in the city, investment advisors who had this on their wall and have told me they refer to it daily when they're talking to clients, which is music to my ears. And so we have a new vital signs in the works with community foundation. It goes out to every household in the province. It gets one of the salt wire newspapers or the bags with the flyers in it. So uh, it, it winds up on kitchen tables and we think it's a, a really important part of the puzzle on civic engagement. Again, nothing alone is the solution, but uh, it's, it's had an amazing response every year. Um, next slide. Sure. Oh, on vital signs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> you know, you think you've heard it all. <laughs> So I'm now with a handheld mic and hopefully it's working for you online. And Kim, actually, why don't you take the mic and talk a bit about RANLAB as you chew your muffin? I'll give you, there you go. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm a lead support for RANLAB, the Regional Analytics Lab. Camera's over that way. There we go, perfect. Um, so uh, it's based on the work you said before from uh, Sims uh, with Jamie Ward. Uh, we have Leslie who's here with us who's just joined the team over the last year. So, so I'm gonna just talk about some highlights of what we've done over the year. Just kind of just step into this, Rob. Ran lab in general or highlights? Okay, so Ran Lab, Regional Analytics Laboratory. Uh, we deal with advanced data analytics and modeling. So we take um, data that's available through Stats Canada, to provincial and other federal government sources, to local industry partners. And I guess what we do that's a little bit different, that's really important to understand than just going to a website and clicking the, the data yourself, is we integrate these sources, but we also spend a lot of time looking at how valid is the data, where is it coming from, has it been standardized, and is it accurately reflect, reflecting the rural nature of our province? 
a lot of times data that we grab statistics from different places have been aggregated. So they're really good for that general average at a provincial level or maybe at an urban level, but doesn't necessarily go out across the whole province, uh, so like the island and, and Labrador portions. Um, and we built up a lot of really great skills and expertise in doing that. The other thing that we do, we're always looking for other better sources of data, ones that aren't necessarily known, or working with groups to help collect their own. Because we do have a lot of things, especially when it comes to a lot of the support services and NGOs that we have out there. So always working on that side of things. So data integrity, data and standardization, and that accurate reflection of rural remote areas that we live in. Once we have all that type of a thing, the other thing that we do is called modeling. So with the modeling, we're taking all that data, we combine all these different sources, um, and then use it for projections out as to how something might change in the future, and then how that applies uh, to what we do and how we make decisions for policy. So if we think about the demographics, our population changes, what that mix of our population looks like from all these different factors, um, how that's going to impact housing in the future. We know that the three bedroom bungalow has been a standard in this province for years. All the houses that were built in the 70s and 80s are based on that. Um, but we know that now with changing family sizes, um, less children being born, uh, more independent units, that that housing market is no longer uh, uh, of interest to our newer population. So then when we look at all of our communities across the province, how does this now impact? And we have these larger homes, but people looking for smaller units. So that's one way that we do this type of modeling and integration of the data. So we do this work um, for research purposes. So we do work with faculty on campus, and that's something we've just started to do really this year, and we're really excited about it, where faculty, um, students, staff that are doing research projects and need some guidance on local data, local issues, um, or on other issues that might be broader, we can still help advise on that, and we are a part of research projects doing that type of work. Uh, we work with corporations and private entities who are looking to do possibly some work in the province, are doing maybe environmental assessments, um, looking at new ideas, we can do work with them. And then we also work with our, um, I guess, uh, counterparts up at the provincial government. We've worked actually with municipal affairs most recently, and as well as with the health accord. And on both of those projects, we actually took our, all our modeling based on our demography and our population and helped project out scenarios. And we fed those back to those groups, and based on that, they're helping, helping them make better and hopefully more informed decisions. We haven't had a chance to look at the budget yet, and all the different changes to healthcare, but it's always nice to know that the work that we're doing are helping inform these really important issues at the province. So that is kind of, I guess, the, the main scope that's done over the last year uh, on the actual analy analytics side. The other thing that's really come out of our work from the last year, and Leslie has been a huge um, supporter for this and is helping us grow and expand capability. And this is actually understanding at a more local and personal level how to access, view, review, and question data that you're seeing. Oh. Sorry. Um, yeah, how you actually um, become more familiar with it ourselves. We are one small group and building capacity at the personal level, at the community level, at the organizational level is going to be critical for this province going forward so that more people have access to it and understand it. So we're just empowering people uh, to build that capacity. So data, by decision, data to Decisions is a new program that we started last year. It's funded in part actually by the Future Skills Center, which is a national initiative on the future of work and labor. Uh, in the country. So we're bringing it down like to be more data focused and understanding it. So there's a series of educational modules that we're doing based on that. And we have uh, hopefully in our growth plan now for this year is to look at how else can we help grow this uh, capacity building side of what we're doing with data. So that's something, certainly if anyone has any suggestions on that, we'd really like to, to hear it. Um, Leslie, is there anything else you think that on the spur of the moment that we could talk about that should be called attention to? Yes, I should have brought that up. Um, uh, www.ranlab.ca. Um, we brought it outside of the Harris Center in one window, mostly because it gives us a lot more flexibility and capacity um, under the traditional MUN structure. It's the same reason why the site Yaffle pop up, that Yaffle is a separate uh, one outside as well. But a lot of the resources we've developed are available there, and they're also linkable through the Harris Center website, of course, as a key part of the, uh, the Harris Center offering. I feel like I should know this, and I don't entirely like have my head wrapped around it, but for like, say, a community partner like me, who's often looking for kind of work on data, what's the, what's the business? Can I come to Ran Lab and say, like, 
I have some analytics that I want done. I like, do I have to come with money for it? Or do you have your budgets? Like, I'd just be curious about that. I feel like that's a useful thing to know. This is a really important point, And thank you for asking what can be a sometimes awkward question. Um, RAN Lab is fully funded by uh, revenues. So we don't receive base funding from the university. But at the same time, um, we also do a lot of projects for the university on different scales. We do have some support actually right now for RAN Lab through a COA to do some local based work. So we try to leverage that however we can. Um, but there's also just a general, depends on the complexity of what you're looking for. So a lot of times we'll get quick questions in from a community or from a group. It, you know, it, it's an hour, it's a couple of hours. We can always entertain that. So the best thing is always say, ask. And we'll say, yep, this is something we can easily pull and we can do it. Or no, this is really a lot more involved. Um, the other thing that we are trying to build for this year is to get much more involved with our students on campus. So we're rebuilding and connecting with geography faculty and some of the students over there, as well as ones that are in economics and actually computer science. Uh, we've been finding some really great students there who can do more of the complicated analytics. So uh, what we'd like to be able to have is some kind of a bridging program where we're actually having the students that are taking these community requests and, and building that out. So that's one of the, um, um, I guess the goal that I know that Liz has been working on as an engagement coordinator. So send the information, send the request. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> From a data or analytical point of view, is it possible? I know it is all, everything is possible. Uh, as we know, we have two data points that have opened up a new piece of the phone. What does, <clears throat> excuse me, what does the province need to do to ensure we capture from the offshore or our non-renewable resources, the monies that go into that, what, what is going to be required to sustain us when that's gone based on the data that you have? Is there a, <laughs> is there so, a program? Yeah, so I am going to say, I am not the person to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think this is probably a bigger issue. So usually what we do with our data work um, when we could help advise, if there was a group that was working on this and had questions about, you know, where, where does this data exist? What types of things are being tracked? Are we tracking them right now? That's the stuff we could help on and possibly help do some interpretation on. But Rob, did you want to address that one a bit more or? Yeah, just to yes. riff off that it's a really fundamental question. And I mean, we have Dave Verdi in the room and Keith Story who have both done work along these lines over the years. And, you know, we had economists like Jim Fian and Wade Locke and Scott Lynch who, and Doug May, who have helped a lot over the years. And we're, as Kim mentioned, re-engaging coming out of the pandemic to see if, who the new young faculty are who might be interested and able to engage on that type. Because it's one thing to have the data, but you have to have the economic analysis and forecasting and financial analysis. And uh, Dave has done a ton of work in the past on related things. Jim Fian. I don't know if we can talk about it yet, but he's done a lot of work with us over the years and is interested in being an associate of the Harris Center. And uh, we, we pay nothing for that distinction, but it, and we have a couple in the room, but it leverages their expertise and becomes a resource we can draw on for projects. But uh, to answer your question, we, we, we don't have the capability to do that, but MUN does. And if funders or partners wanted to come to us to work on something like that, we'd be all over it. And Ed? So actually it's something that Josh said. Um, for a while now, I've been looking at the uh, Water for the Institute of Technology in Ireland that has a system of vouchers that communities can access in order to purchase time with their faculty. Uh, I'm thinking for RANLAB, if we could have a fund that is essentially a voucher, the community organizations can apply for a certain amount of money and RANLAB can decide whether they want to take the project on or not. So uh, I think that would be kind of fun. Yeah, so <laughs> okay, and nothing from online? I see a few chat buttons. I don't know if it's eligible for this or not, or applicable to this one. Comments? Oh, keep the mic up here. It's amazing. I'm also allowed, so I'm surprised that my voice is not carrying. Okay, so Yaffle. 
Uh, YAFL, our whole YAFL development, kind of what's going on with it, is led by uh, Mandy Strickland. She is watching online, I believe. Uh, but don't worry, Mandy, I am not going to call on you <laughs> to come on camera all of a sudden. So YAFL.ca, this has been a tool that's been around on now for over 10 years. I think uh, people have various familiarity with it. Uh, it was started within the Harris Center to help the support that we do, help support the work that we do. It has been going under a technology redevelopment that I'm just really tired of talking about because it's been about two years. Uh, but it's a reflection of the struggle we're having right now with having enough uh, IT and skilled programmers in the province to help us do our work. So our redevelopment is going a little bit slower. Um, but what YAFL does is it is a, it's a repository. It is a listing of the research that's being done at the university, the people who are working on it, and how they're connected. And I think that's probably the, the core focus of what uh, YAFL is. Content traditionally in the old model was being put in by faculty. And we knew that that was, has been a struggle, that faculty have enough things to be doing, let alone going into another system and adding more, um, just more tasks to be done. So under the current model, we're again working with students, taking advantage of our ISWEP students, our MUSEP students, our grad students as they're available to help scan the university and look for projects that all have uh, this type of an engagement and, and, um, and uh, yeah, an engagement of an aspect to it. We don't host the research there. We provide a nice summary of what the research is about, and then we link out to where you can find more information, either research reports or the people that are working on it or a website, um, proceedings that might be recorded online. So that is the purpose of YAFL. Most recently, what's going on with it is that uh, we've always had several universities and uh, over the years have been interested in being able to use YAFL. We weren't able to do that as it was held inside in the MUN systems. So part of our technology development is to pull it out and it's now in the cloud. Whatever that is, it's now out in the cloud. Uh, and we have seven institutions that are right now are either signed up or in the process of signing up to do what's called a pilot run. So we've got um, York University is there, McMaster is there. Um, Mandy Strickland would know a lot more. Mandy, if you wanna type them in the chat box. Uh, we have um, CCFI, Canadian Center for Fisheries Innovation up at Marine Institute. They're actually using it uh, to help archive or show case all of their projects that they're doing with community members. So as YAFL expands out, it's not just for the university who want to take on their communities. We're also doing it now with interest groups. Um, you know, at anyone that works on data has reports or has information that they want to make more available or to be able to connect people through it. Uh, we do have, though, have our official launch, and this is my can announce the date, Rob, because we're staying to it. It's going to be in May. I don't have a day, but it's going to be in May. <laughs> that we do know is part of the CARA conference that's coming down here. Um, yeah, so any questions about YAFL? How we can use that? Anyone, yeah, more effectively? Nope, nothing online? Okay, that's it for YAFL. Hey, Kim, I didn't warn anybody I'd be calling on them, but uh, you can tell how good they are. They just jump right in. And so what's up next here? Ah, right on. And I do believe Sheila Downer is in her home in the Labrador Straits. And she is our Northern liaison in the Harris Center, but also does a lot of work in partnership with the Office of Public Engagement with Memorial's Coasts Initiative, Cold Oceans and Arctic Science, Technology and Society. And She's a VP with the University of the Arctic. And when the previous president uh, was advocating the Coast Initiative and saw the University of the Arctic as a group that many MUN faculty were already connecting with, but that we could do a lot more with and help strengthen Memorial's recognition internationally, but also to access additional resources. Um, he and Sheila and Gerald Anderson from the Marine Institute did a lot of work with the federal government because it had been active in the Arctic for a while and then it had eased off during the Stephen Harper years. And so Global Affairs Canada stepped up with a significant funding package. And uh, maybe Sheila, you can speak some more in detail if you are there. Mandy is enabling you to speak is, are we there? Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Loud and clear. Okay, great. 
good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be part of this. Uh, so as Rob was saying, uh, the Global Arctic Leadership Initiative is uh, a big part of Memorial's international uh, network, networking and partnership uh, collaborations. It's funded through Global Affairs Canada, uh, and it's implemented in partnership with the University of the Arctic and Yukon University. So it's basically a $5.4 million initiative that supports four work packages under memorials management and coordination. Um, and these work packages basically include uh, an increased engagement of Canadian Arctic members in new Arctic activities, uh, with a particular focus on increasing engagement of Indigenous and Northern members. And we are now currently in the process of recruiting for an engagement coordinator to move this forward. Uh, another work packages are uh, uh, work of the four work packages is project funds. Uh, and this supports the establishment of two funds. One that supports provides up to fifteen thousand uh, dollars to support researchers and faculty that are looking to establish a relationship with an indigenous group or community. Uh, where a relationship doesn't currently exist and with the intent of working towards a future project. And the other fund provides up to $40,000 to support collaborations of Canadian New Arctic members with members from other countries uh, to work together on research or education uh, initiatives. The third work package includes supports for the establishment of two New Arctic Indigenous chairs. This is uh, a fairly new initiative that has been added to the initial funding, but this will see uh, two indigenous chairs, one to be hosted by uh, Memorial School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies, and the other to be hosted at Yukon University. And these positions will support collaborations and Northern led and co-creation of research and curriculum. And the final work package is, uh, one uh, that supports an initiative being carried out by the GEAL Centre, which focuses on a youth climate collective, and it provides um, supports for staff and activities that encourage youth across the province. Uh, we've seen uh, the establishment of two in Labrador, and then there's a network across the um, across the island part of the province. Uh, that encourages activities focused on climate change, uh, that are, but that are being uh, decided upon and carried out by youth. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thanks, Sheila. Any anything online? Questions, comments on that, or in the room? And again, this one, you know, there's Venn diagrams with our relationship with the Office of Public Engagement with the uh, Marine Institute, Labrador campus, Grenville campus, but because of the Harris Center background experience uh, to manage funds. And uh, also a lot of this work leverages the Labrador uh, strength that Memorial has, but also our partnership with Nunavut Arctic College and the long history of work Sheila and I have in the North, came out of the North Atlantic Islands program and now the North Atlantic Forum and Boyan has done a ton of work on islands, and we're actually looking at a possible Arctic Islands workshop that may flow from some of this programming. So some really useful, I think, and building capacity and extending our reach. So, okay, we'll go to the next slide. Community Hubs, again, one that is new, uh, new it, and came out of the pandemic when Kelly, and Ken Carter and colleagues at Grenfell Camp uh, were working with community partners in St. George's and in Port Saunders, Indigenous organizations, Port Saunders also with the women's organization. When students were all go having to go online, and if you were in a community that didn't have high speed or a house that didn't have high speed, you were in hard shape. And yet there were these offices of community-based organizations that did have high speed and they had a, a, a boardroom or some meeting space, and they were willing to allow students to come in and download their materials and maybe some quiet study space. And so Kelly and Ken and those community groups figured out a, a pilot and got it going. 
and kind of made them as they went on. When the president did her provincial road trip on the island in Labrador, heard from lots of students and parents and community leaders, <clears throat> without broadband, we're in trouble. And asked me to take on an initiative working with Grenfell and Labrador campus through the Harris Center to see if we get some funding to expand that model to other locations. And as we've talked about in this session and countless other sessions, the capacity in rural and remote Newfoundland and Labrador, with a few exceptions, has really been hurt with the demise of the red bees and other lack of organizational capacity. And so this is an innovative, I would say idiosyncratic, we did a call for proposals. We had a good response. We had some funding from ACOA in the province for startup funds over two years for a pilot and a big emphasis on continuing education. And Memorial is looking at its offerings and already, I mean, Marine Institute does a ton, the Gardner Center and the business school, uh, the health professions all do a lot of continuing ed, but we don't have a lifelong learning division anymore. Uh, Elsa Craig is now a special advisor working on how we get back a coordinated approach at Memorial. Renful Campus still does some of this and is a staff person there. And so we now have, I think, seven locations up and running. Maybe the next slide shows this. There you go. And a whole bunch about to come on. And we have a partnership with the Public Libraries Board. Like any new initiative, it's forming, storming, norming, performing. And so we had to get through MUN legal and procurement. We're a big, ugly organization, but for good reasons. It's public money and we need to handle it right. But very persistent, patient, collaborative partners. And the hub in St. George's, in Cartwright, in Forteau, in Indian Bay are just on, on wheels. And there's a dynamism and Boyan is our chair of our program committee. Kim manages all the budget stuff. For the very first time, the Harris Center has an employee at Grenfell campus. And Joanne is the coordinator for the Community Hubs Initiative. And she works closely with Go Engagement, Jennifer Buxton, Ken Carter. And we have a steering committee still with Ashley Consolo from Labrador. And as Sheila mentioned, Kim Ship the director of the Geo Center is leading the Climate Collective with Geo, with Global Affairs funding, many moving parts here, typical project development, piece it all together. But Global Affairs sent staff to the open of the Cartwright Hub and loved it. And so we think there's a lot of opportunity to do more in Labrador and elsewhere in the North under the Climate Collective Partnership. And we wanted a diversity of initial partners for the two-year pilot. And we expect to have, I expect to have another five or 10 who want any upfront funding, but still want to be hubs. And they'll be coming into place over the next few weeks, I think. Um, and continuing education, community identifying its training needs, but with the new Tech L NL initiative and Key in College with rural tech training, that opportunity looks like you could use the hubs. Uh, Kelly Vaden and Ray Thomas at Grenfell developed a big research funding project that has research liaisons at some of the original community hubs. So once you establish a relationship, stuff you didn't expect to happen happens. And I think as Josh noted, there's a whole bunch of capacity being built around the province in different silos. And I think the hubs could be literally hubs to help connect people in space, but also maybe just with a common reference point. And for the Harris Center, the hub, we're not the boss of the content of the hubs. We're the manager of the relationship, but we're looking to faculty, staff, and students and community partners to step and say, step up and say, yes, we want to work together. Here's some ideas. I suspect Joanne is online, probably Jennifer and Ken. If anybody wants to add to what I've said, let Mandy know. Or are there any comments or questions on this? Fraser, yes, please. 
have to ask a question pertaining to what we kept receiving the news the other day where the minister uh, in federal terms announced something 48 million uh, for setting up broadband or whatever it was for something like 3,800 homes. I also saw an, an argument coming back, well, why didn't you simply spend on Sterling uh, and you would have got uh, 135,000 homes? I'm just wondering what is the technology or is there someone out there that, it's one I want to say hi to Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila and I go back many, many years um, in Boise Bay and beyond and the, the Expo Labrador. So I have to say a special hi to Sheila up in, up in uh, I believe, Lancer Clear. Uh, anyway, but the, the, the concern that I had was, are we utilizing the best technology that's available to improve this? And is it available if you had Sterling in Cartwright, does it work? I know I was up in, in Cartwright only last year, and I was, when I was driving down by past the Port Hope Simpson, I did a search for, to go online to see if it was wireless, and what came up on my phone was you're connected to the International Space Station. So the technology is up there somewhere, but that's a question I would have. Are we utilizing what is available, and if it's is Starling not what it's really sold at? Thank you. Yeah, because I certainly am not. I was going to say our folks at Secor are experts in all that. But Kim, you want to weigh in? Yeah, so the quick answer, um, well, the, the policy issue over why we've gone with fiber broadband across all of our north, that is a, that's a debate across the country. One that I'm really interested in as well, because I'm a Starlink user myself. Uh, but Cartwright is actually using a Starlink system. And that was actually supported as part of the Climate Collective Project that's being done with um, Kim Ship and the Geo Center as part of a youth component. Um, because as a gathering center, they didn't have reliable internet. A lot of our areas now across the province do actually have reliable internet. They mightn't have it in the homes, but the centers that we're selecting to be these hubs have it. Uh, Cartwright did not, and it wasn't easy for them to get it. They needed that reliability. So they actually are using the Starlink system. Um, Sheila could probably add a little bit more on how well it's working. I haven't heard anything about it since we've sent it up to them. So I'm assuming it's working really well. Um, so the hubs, again, part of the requirement was that they would actually have this capacity there. Uh, and again, so we, we are the convener, we're the organizer of, and we help solve the problem. We can't necessarily fix them, but we'll help them try to find solutions. Um, but there haven't been any issues that I've been aware of yet where someone's saying that their internet accessibility isn't up to par or are having any issues to help connect everyone. But yeah, that bigger issue over Starlink versus, that's just a personal interest, uh, is definitely an ongoing issue. Yeah, and if I, I can, the only thing I would add is just to support what you've just said, Kim, but uh, again, my experience or knowledge of many homes and businesses are now using Starlink in Labrador, and for the most part, people are very happy with it in comparison to, you know, previous um, quality of service, I guess, from, from their bill service provider. Thanks, Sheila, and uh, you uh, obviously have a fan in Fraser. And Sheila, as folks may know, was lead on Smart Labrador for many years. And so we're actually, you know, reinventing some of the learnings we had previously with the ACOA Enterprise Network and the, uh, the uh, what were they called? The sites, cap sites. And so I think for us, having internet access is key but we're not, we're, we're, we're open to whatever type of internet access. For us, it's the program and the space and the facilitation of coming together. And that's really creating energy. Okay, next slide. So that's all the song and dance. Um, we, I think we're going to noon. So feel free, please, to think about stuff that we haven't talked about at all that you think we should have on our agenda. And maybe Dave, I'll just speak to this slide first and then go to you next. Because this really is our five-year plan goals. And we, over the various five-year plans, sound like the Soviet Union here, the, the next five-year plan, but they're flexible and it's why we do this annual strategic action plan update. But we've got down to three broad goals. 
serve as a bridge between Memorial and the province, be a trusted source of information, analysis, and convening. And then the internal goal, which you must focus on if you're going to function well, is maintain high performance operations. Um, I had in mind when I was thinking about this session last night, I'd get all our team to introduce themselves and say how long they had been with the Harris Center. And we have, I'm 19 years now, but we have several people well over 10 years. We have several others, you know, five to 10. And then we have some brand new people. So I'm really tickled pink about the group of people, the knowledge, the commitment, and in an era of labor market challenges where skilled, capable people can go anywhere, anytime, the commitment to the Harris Center remains, like you said, Fraser. And so there are a core of staff and stakeholders who believe the work and we're proud of that. Uh, the final point I'd just make, and maybe Mandy, we do need one more slide next time, is on the convening role because we recently were asked by DFO to facilitate and do the What We Heard report on the SEAL Summit. Very contentious, very tangly, and we, a lot of planning for many months went into that, but the event went like a charm, and they trusted us as the integrity, the honest broker, the facilitator, we're heading out to Gander soon with a session on Capelin. And when we take that on, we make sure the steering committee as industry, as union, as people from the university, community-based organizations, indigenous. So we don't do a project for someone to advance their particular perspective. And we've turned down money and projects many times because protecting our brand is key. So as we go forward, thank you. Are there things you think we should seed new stuff or feed, do more of, or we get rid of? And that's thanks to Morgan Murray, our Alberta farm boy who was with us for several years. And Dave Hardy, over to you. You got a mic. doing is really good work and the Harry Center is going to enable it, keeping this high level of energy going. And the, the whole process we've been planning is every year, we do it every year, and we provide the opportunity for people to come to the table and all that's really great. I think you're, you're in a really good position. And uh, a lot of comments, millions of comments made, uh, well, it's not, it's not going to make uh, much of a comment on all the things that I report, but uh, why don't you just... Um, you know, just make general comments. First of all, going back to Fraser's comment about the, all the biomass. I mean, I was involved with the um, I major mean, project of the Senior Public Service of the divestiture of the bow water paper mill. So prior to that, I had very little knowledge of the cut and paper industry. But I got involved in the industry over a period of 18 months. And we were successful in bringing in a new operator to take over from bow water. And that was a long time ago. But since then, we've lost Stephenville Mill lost Grand Falls Mill, and Bow Water, that used to be the Bow Water Mill, and it could be interrupted to Saxon Kilgore to run, uh, is, is a shadow of what it used to be. So there's one hell of a lot of biomass on this island, and in Labrador, that is available, and it's you know, a great opportunity. We used to examine, and it seems to me the sawmill industry is really just not really uh, building up to take the site, so there seems to be a lot of opportunity there. So was one comment. The other comment, again, going back to what Fraser said, I hope make this comment, but you're, I'm a Rotarian, and my World Health Hub is, is, is struggling, it's, it's oblivion, okay? And I think any kind of, um, most organizations, and I'm involved in research, and all these social organizations are sputtering, and they're not working in place. There's something happened to our society, and it increases the challenge for the Harris Center, and, uh, you know, in terms of the numbers, statistically, today. So I just want to make the comment that I spent 
a lot of time involved with energy over the last 10, 12 years, focusing on the Muscat Falls project and other things. I've just been being involved with a panel on Churchill Falls and uh, all that. And I'm focusing very much on what's going on in hydrogen world and wind and uh, biomass and, and solar, all those kinds of issues. And, uh, but, but just going back to the Muscat Falls entirely, uh, and that was a, I was part of that, and we, I was a, a part of a group that was standing at the Muscat Falls inquiry. And we were there for 18 months, uh, providing evidence to our lawyer and working with three of us putting enormous amounts of pro bono time into this. And every now and then I'd ask the question, how many people are online watching this? The only people were basically were public servants, and, uh, and the people had hydro, uh, Newton and Howell, and the people, uh, the, the field was the public. The field was the, the, field was the public. And that, was a, that was an amazing thing. And uh, we had a wonderful commission. We did a remarkable report, and that report is six volumes. And it's, uh, we're nobody talking about it. It's partly because of COVID, because it came out just a couple of weeks literally before COVID did. So, but anyway, just so it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge that has to be met. Um, the third thing I'm going to make comment on is my general comment, and that is on compassion and the whole question of capacity of the university and the, uh, the whole question of bottom up versus top down. And I like uh, what I wonder, but it's my, the question I'm leading up to is to what extent does the Harris Center provide an opportunity for communities to speak? Uh, to the university about what capacity they need from the university. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking right now about all these proposals that are coming in to build uh, wind and hydrogen uh, projects on the island and, and in around the world. And uh, the extent to which, and what I'm perceiving is that communities are being overwhelmed because they don't have the expertise and they need a lot of understanding about uh, how, we, how all of this fits into a whole international context. And uh, so, and I think there's an important role for the university here in dealing with this, because this is, wind is a, a big opportunity in, uh, in, in our province. We do have a lot of wind. Uh, when I look at the, the, uh, the whole move towards renewables throughout the world, uh, what I see is that those places in the world that can combine wind and solar wind and solar energy uh, have the opportunity to provide a higher load factor, whereas wind is very non-dispatching. You, you don't know when the wind goes, when it's not going to blow, and, and that kind of stuff. So there's a, people, there's a tendency for people to think that, uh, that we got wind, and wind is going to revolutionize our economy and all that kind of stuff. And it's a, a big uh, pile of cold water needs to be thrown on a lot of that, because I think a lot of it is overblown, and I think a lot of it is predicated on government support in one shape or another. And, uh, and, and, but all of this is very, uh, and I'm very familiar with it all, I've been studying it for a long period of time, but I think the university needs to be, if it doesn't have the expertise, it needs to build a few of that expertise, because it's so important to communities around the province, regions and communities. And uh, so what my question, I guess, is, is there a mechanism whereby the community, what you're working with, you know, through the community hubs and so on, that you can articulate what, uh, what capacity the communities need to meet the main level there, what they need from Memorial University, and how can Memorial University serve them better? Uh, and with, during the pandemic, you know, uh, we've all been sort of uh, overwhelmed by trying to protect ourselves from the scourge of the pandemic and so on. And now we've, most of us have, have had COVID and we're saying, so that was just a cold, most people. It was, it really didn't have enormous impact, but we all went into a shell. Well, mostly a lot of us went into a shell and, uh, and the university was, did not become visible. The university became invisible. Everything became invisible except uh, 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 Dr. Fitzpatrick, Dr. Fitzgerald. They, it, was, it was dominating the airwaves. Okay? Nobody was saying anything or anything. But in any event, I think the university uh, it, it really needs to uh, look at how it's serving the community in terms of economic opportunities and wind and wind and hydrogen and solar and members of fishery, all these kinds of questions. Uh, so I, I think that you guys are doing great work. The final comment I'd make is when, when the Harris Center uh, was um, created, 
back in October of 2004, there was this conference that was held at the corner book. And a lot of good things came out of that conference. And uh, one of the things about it was that there's a, there was a combination, and you were, you were the, the, the architect of this thing, putting it together. And what you did was you, you put out a, an invitation for people to participate on the subject of their choice. And then on top of that, you went out and reached out to people and said, we'd like for you and you to come to the table. And then you put 100 people in a room and you had a breakout session. You had invited the premier and the minister of justice and various people. And I am going to talk about housing things that came out of that. So I'm, I know you're thinking about some other things that happened at that event. But, but I, I think it's time to recreate that for them because it's, uh, it was a great opportunity to sort of go back to those principles and do your breakouts and do your, your wrap up. And you come out of it at the end with some kind of consensus about where this outfit is going by engaging a, a group of people from across the province. And I thought it was a really, really good exercise. It's probably time to do it again. And I would say this last thing should be a part of it. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. No, that was fantastic, as always. And certainly when Evan developed the Harris Center mandate, built the building capacity in the university or, or being a champion for it was a key part of it. And I, through my role, worked closely with the deans and the VPs and the president, constantly bringing these learnings to them. YAFL is a tool that constantly, 24 seven, people can submit ideas for projects and, and needs. They're thriving region workshops. We network constantly and I speak on, and various of us do on the media and in uh, conferences and workshops. So all that is, and these sessions are constantly aggregating, gathering and identifying new opportunities. Um, significant, I think for us, as we think about that initial conference, we had a quite a big deal 10th anniversary conference where we commissioned five academics to look at all the work we had done in five policy fields. And that everyone agrees that was a kick ass conference. And the panels were really good. So we're getting ready now for next year, thinking about our 20th anniversary conference. And so, really useful for us to remember some of those early sessions. And as we think about what that, and we're thinking our 20th anniversary is right on the beginning of the memorial 100th anniversary anniversary celebrations. So we're, it's a work in progress, but your points are well taken. Other thoughts, comments? We have 15 minutes. You have Mike? No, I'll give you. Yeah, just a couple of thing, final things from me that are that have floated as as we're talking. Just again, like maybe forward looking into some of this piece, is just thinking about how what's on the Harris Center's radar screen aligns with kind of what are the big dominating social policy things that are going to come out in the next little while. Like so, in, like in my world right now, it's interesting because people are looking at Newfoundland and Labrador as a bit of a social policy laboratory just because it happens that a bunch of big things are happening. Like if you take seriously, like if you take seriously the health accord, it actually is a very radical document, right? Uh, I think in a good way, but uh, you know, like if, if we are serious about, and I think has some really radical implications from a regional development perspective, and then we'll have this new, uh, what's called social and economic well-being plan, poverty reduction strategy 2.0 this year. There's an all party committee on basic income that will report in, in June. So I'm just thinking about like the next year or two years or three years, like, how does that fit into some of the conversations that the Harris Center can convene? I'm glad that the civics kind of piece is on the radar screen. I'm just thinking, because like my big worry in this, uh, and this is maybe the second point, is just so clear how lacking, uh, without, I'm not trying to like sass anybody, but the, the provincial government is really lacking policy capacity, right? Like, I don't think that's an, a controversial thing to say. I'm quote my green, God help me. But like, there's... <laughs> But there's not a lot of capacity in house, right? Like we, we encounter that a lot where it's just like things are getting left on the shelf or it takes a long time to get to things. So maybe just, I guess what's dominating my mind a bit is like how can the Harris Center play a role in moving those conversations forward? Because I'm finding a lot of them are, they're really new to people, you know, like getting the 
Department of Transportation and Works to think about themselves as part of the social determinants of health is a big hill to climb, right? And so like, what, how does this all play out? It's just kind of um, sitting in my mind here as like, we've been this like really radical menu of things has been put on the table, but there's not yet like the infrastructure to really engage people with it. And so like, you know, just flagging in, in this conversation, I think there's some places where the Harris Center can maybe, I don't know, identify where those the weakest points are, the blind spots are, and try and fill them in a little bit. It's just like as we as we talked, that's been really floating in circles. So I'll leave it there. I love that, Josh, and and thanks. And as mentioned earlier, the uh, Pat Parfrey, when they were doing the Health Accord, met with Jamie Ward. I think every week and using the geospatial analysis catchment area, blah, 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 to help inform the work. And he did circle back to me a few times on the regional policy side of it and lessons from the Red Bees and the strategic social plan and brought me in to present to all deputies a few months back. And so I think there's a receptivity and awareness and we've had long, long history of working with, as Kim mentioned, municipal affairs and economic development department. I had a call yesterday with the ADM on ongoing collaboration. So I think those areas, and as you know, I'm not young anymore. So the Economic Recovery Commission did a ton of work on the guaranteed annual income and Doug May and Patty Powers and others. And so I was on the periphery of that. But I think as that stuff emerges, it is core to where Harris Center fulfilling its role. And I'm really excited about some of the new young faculty who are stepping up. And you know they need to get their publications, they need to teach their courses, but they want to engage. Um, Mandy, any, I have a couple more in the room, but Mandy, any online before we go to them? Okay, so. Well, I did say, well, on two fronts, and we talked earlier about the, the transit opportunity relating to climate change in rural areas, and Josh and MNL, and maybe the CBDC Association, but there's a group. Yep. <laughs> and, but also on the civics initiative, I, I did mention there's some new young faculty in political science who are really wanting to collaborate. So we're and I think part of it is coming out of the pandemic. And uh, so we need to keep the pedal to the metal and get some stuff done. Um, I'll go to this gentleman here for a quick comment and then back to Fraser. My question is very simple. Where can I get the PPI, uh, PP to file? Okay, I, well, I got just two quick comments. One, I, I, a plug for vital science. In the real world, that that it is being used. I attended the function up at uh, uh, the campus up on Signal Hill. Happened to be going to a board meeting with Newfoundland Labrador Housing, and it was just prior to Fiona. I referenced this page. Which has shows the sea line, the coastline, it was out to 2099, but it, that that hit pretty quick. The question that I did ask at the board meeting was the staff: Are we prepared? We have 9,600 homes that live in Labrador Housing Authority, but those that are close to the coastline, or those homes that are close to the coastline, are we prepared? Mm. Are we taking action? And therefore, when I presented them with this. They are reading it. <laughs> Hopefully, there's a committee structure that will be taken care of. The second comment that I wanted to make was to do with, uh, particularly was to do with the Harris Center and the importance of seniors who are now aging in place. Mm -hmm. And also, it's the biggest part of our population. There was an article in McLean's magazine. I have to read the one little quick article on it. But with note, it said, seniors want to continue to live among young people and families. 
not just play golf and be entertained until death. Very good comment. And I think it's reflective of a lot more of the seniors that are here within our province and uh, seniors that still want to contribute. Yep. So I don't know if the, the Harris Center is looking at if that's going to happen, what supports are going to be required in the communities around our province, mm -hmm. because it, it is reflective of the health support and the recommendations coming from it. But our, all of our communities have to be prepared to provide the necessary social uh, and well-being or the personal services that may need to be offered rather than being put away in some kind of a institution. No, couldn't agree more. And as you probably know, you were probably one of the organizers. We partnered with the seniors organizations, and I forget the gentleman's name, Mike Keel, uh, on a seniors employment integration workshop, Kathy and the team uh, played a key role on that. Our faculty of medicine, as you know, and applied health research, and the Newfoundland Laboratory Center of Applied Health Research has one of their uh, affinity groups that works in that space. And at Grenfell campus, there's the Aging Research Center, and uh, our Harris Center employee there, Joanne, is also collaborating with them College mobilization. And so I think it's a, and it, when you think about the health accord and the rural outreach and hubs and God knows what else. Um, so it's a balancing act, as we know, when we do some of these demographic presentations, we need family friendly communities and we need as many immigrants and migrants and newborns. But we got a big chunk of seniors who are not wanting to just do nothing. And it's a massive opportunity in the labor force, in local governance, et cetera. So uh, no, couldn't, couldn't agree more on that. Andy, any final thoughts, comments from anyone? Razor, I don't know if you uh, send out the word, we got 37 people online there now. <laughs> I, oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, lots of very interesting comments and um, I completely concur with uh, much of which uh, Dave has said. He prompted one thought though, uh, and that was uh, with respect to uh, organizations losing their luster, their, mm. their, their fire, their, all the rest of it, right? Uh, and something else somebody else said, uh, oh, I know. The only person that has mentioned youth in today is Sheila. And that was the Youth Climate uh, Collective. Yes. Now, when you go back to your next slide, which is seed, feed, and weed, which I think is a wonderful uh, uh, <laughs> way to think about things. Once upon a time, I uh, one of these meetings, in the feed section, uh, youth was a key element. We've heard lots about, not lots about, but we've had mention of uh, uh, seniors' participation, and that's that's clearly all kinds of opportunities and thoughts there. But I would suggest that we don't forget, if we, if indeed we have, mm -hmm. uh, the youth component. They're going to be the leaders. How do we make sure that they are still here, involved, and uh, 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 informed? Mm. No, great, uh, great point, Keith. And uh, we've done some stuff over the years, uh, but not as much as I, I do believe in one related role I have, as you know, is AVP public engagement for Memorial. And we are about to embark on the development of a new public engagement strategy. We'll hit the ground running in September, probably on that. I do believe one of the areas Memorial could do a lot more on, and the Harris Center could be part of that, is on one of the terms used elsewhere, service learning, but in particular, curricular service learning. And now, so again, depending on how you define youth, that's still focusing on university students, and Evan, from the beginning, Cords had the name, the word in it, studies, because he wanted to make sure that 
We did the outreach, we did the connecting, we did connection on research, but also connected with teaching and learning. And that's been the tougher nut to crack for forever, as you know. There's been some good things, good stuff happening at Grenfell on a rural research center and some of the programming they've done, et cetera. Um, but I think in co-op and internships are really a key piece of that. But I think we could do more. We also have with our Coast Initiative, some really interesting things happening every day now with Rebecca Coho and, and a graduate student who's a whale researcher reaching out to K to 12 on careers related to oceans. And they're getting like a thousand students. Am I making this up, Mandy? Do you know? <laughs> and and so there's a there is a hunger for that, Keith. I couldn't agree more. And and uh, I know some grandkids who are involved in the uh, some of the programs that uh, engineering schools mm. uh, offer, and they're wonderful. But they are so small in terms of the numbers of, of kids that uh, uh, are, can be engaged. Mm. Uh, and so there, there's, there are things being done. There's no question yep. about it. But, but as I say, once upon a time, the, this was an element of the Harris Center's, uh, not mandate, but interest areas. Mm. Uh, and that seems to have uh, mm. uh, disappeared off the radar somewhat. Yeah. And that I, this was just a, a, a suggestion as a reminder. No, nope, that's a great point. And to, be, to add to it, I hope I don't pull this up. Boy, and Randy will correct me. Part of what Rebecca did to get the reach and traction was partnered with, I think it was Let's Talk Science, which was an existing organization with an existing network so instead of trying to invent something, and of course, that's our job. I often joke, I don't do any work. I just find people who do great gig. And, and so as a broker with public engagement is all about people from inside the university and outside doing stuff together. And I think there's a lot more to do in that regard with you. And I think we've heard a lot of great input here today to help us shape this year's plan and ongoing. Uh, Kim, any final thoughts, comments you'd have? I think it might be if you want. We don't feel obliged. I actually, do, I actually don't know if I do have any. Um, I know a comment on the youth. And uh, so I've been with the center now for six years. Um, I think one of the early sessions that we had, Keith, uh, we were looking at a much larger youth involvement uh, with our thriving regions. I think going into communities, going in, I think that was something we were looking on. Um, a lot of what we do for expanded programs, um, you know, we're always looking for the funding and the support for to help gather and convene and get people out there. So that's a nice reminder to get that back on, uh, on our radar again, uh, for sure. Um, other than that, I think this is, there's so many things happening in the province. And I think everyone here who's contributed something has hit on that. And I think that's a lot that we can really take as we look at how we're going forward. Because this really is a time you can see our, you know, our, our plan has changed significantly down to our three goals. We've got several objectives kind of identified on, under that that we're working on. Uh, but I think all the issues that you've hit on uh, very well fit into where our thinking was going. Some areas we hadn't thought about, but we're integrating really nicely. You know what? Actually, I'm good. I said a lot. I'm good too. <laughs> I think this is very comprehensive. <laughs>